Levin, director of the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon and director of the Art and Code Festival. Uh, this is the final presentation at Art and Code Homemade Digital Tools Crafty Approaches in January of 2021. And our final presenter tonight is Kelly Anderson. Kelly Anderson is an artist, designer, animator, and tinkerer who pushes the limits of ordinary materials by seeking out possibilities hidden in plain view. Her books have included a pop-up paper planetarium, a book that transforms into a pinhole camera and a working paper record. Intentionally low fidelity, she believes that humble materials can undo black boxes and make the magic of our world accessible. Ladies and gentlemen, and all friends, Kelly Anderson. Hey, you all. Um, so I wanted to start here with the uh, paper animated GIF that I contributed to the awesome zine that we collectively made. Um, so this is a good thing to perhaps print out at home and make for a friend who needs a little help uh, reminding not to doom scroll all day. So um, thank you so much for having me, everyone. Um, so I've been making homemade things uh, from my one room studio apartment for over a decade now. Um, as I've been working as an artist and experimental printmaker, a coder and animator, um, a professor and author, a paper craft music video maker. <laughs> Um, and within these four walls, I've worked on secret brand redesigns uh, from my desk. And then I've also designed everything, logos, menus, bags, wallpapers, um, architectural facades um, for things like this 100 year old bagel and locks institution called the Russ and Daughters. Um, this is a facade I designed in Photoshop, which is not ideal, but definitely scrappy. Um, but we completed our third restaurant together in 2019. So it's working out. Um, I've published two books from my desk here. And I've um, participated in, in small ways in two of the major protest movements of my generation, um, Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter. So um, I feel like staying homemade and staying small and sort of in control of my path hasn't limited what I've been able to do, but rather has allowed me the freedom to show up for like the occasions and life and culture that really matter to me. And like this paper animated GIF, um, I, I can't say for sure uh, that I understand exactly how it works. There we go. Um, I can only understand the flexagon from frame to frame really. And I never have had even more than like a one year plan for my career. Um, but my hands found a way to make it work and I can show you the extremely scrappy way um, that I make the things I do. So for me, having the freedom to explore and tinker and, and wander to advance the plot has felt really key. Um, and I want to acknowledge that like having the capacity to allow such uncertainty and anarchism into one's life is um, not a privilege that everyone has. Um, an interesting case study uh, in the question of how does one structure a life and career um, are these two brothers that I feel all of the contrast in the world uh, resides within. This is Robert and uh, J. Frank Oppenheimer. 
And both started out with this preternatural talent for science. Both were headed on a track destined to become like top physicists in their field. Um, and Robert succeeded on every count. He sort of garnered every professional vestige of success. He rose to the very top of his field, um, leading the Manhattan Project, and he became the, the father of the atomic bomb. And Frank, while equally brilliant, um, was completely banned from doing professional work in his field uh, due to an affiliation with the Communist Party. Uh, so Frank, with his you know, career and um, his life's dream stripped away by McCarthyism, moved to a ranch. He ended up farming cattle for a little while. He taught some high school. Um, and he eventually, he embarked on a path that no one had previously tread, no one even saw coming. And what he built out of this um, exile was the realization that the world needed a museum of human perception to make science accessible and suitable to every person. And so he began raising the funds to build um, what would become the Exploratorium, which is a museum where visitors um, can use their hands and learn um, that the world's seemingly mundane materials all around us actually contain real deep and profound magic. So Frank used his brilliance to make that joy of possibility and discovery and tinkering that science offers us contagious. Um, while his brother, Jay Robert, who followed the highest achieving path of success laid out for him as structured by the field of physics, um, who won all of the prizes, um, found his way into creating the most dangerous weapon of mass destruction ever invented. Um, I was a fellow at the Exploratorium um, in 2019, in the before times, uh, and while I was there, I thought a lot about these brothers and their wildly divergent fates. And um, really came to think of them as representing the two sides of the coin of what we call technology offers us. Um, one is about this like ongoing pursuit of understanding and the pursuit of curiosity. And the other one is about the seeking of power and destruction. Um, since the pandemic hit, many of us, I think, feel like Frank on the cattle ranch. Uh, we are trapped in exile in our own lives. Um, so I want this, talk to be an opportunity to think about what the destinations are on these two paths um, and perhaps give yourself permission um, to daydream and close your eyes and imagine a more strange and personal destination for yourself. Uh, Jane Jacobs, who wrote my favorite design book of all time, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, I may be a person who considers this a design book, but um, she makes this point beautifully that the world is full of all of this false order and all of this false structure that doesn't necessarily deserve our respect. Um, and I think that the, the moment we truly realize this, like the moment we internalize this um, is the moment we become empowered as creative people um, listening to our own rather than those externally imposed imperatives and structures. Um, this frees us from our fixed assumption about what the world needs, what we should be making, um, what has to be done, what materials we're allowed to work with, um, and allows us to like go straight for pushing at the bounds of what's possible and just explore. And I found design is really like the perfect tool and the perfect methodology to do this because design doesn't care like what is supposed to work. Design doesn't care what you're supposed to do. Um, design only cares about what you can make, what can actually be prototyped, what type of graphic design actually communicates to the person looking at it. Um, everything is about um, tests and like proofs of those tests. And it doesn't require fancy tools. Like in my work, um, I found that even the most ubiquitous low tech materials like um, sheet materials like paper and sheet plastic are capable of revealing new amazing facets of our reality. Um, sheet materials in particular, like they scale dramatically. So the same principles that work in tiny handheld experiences can be scaled up to the level of spacecraft, which is something we'll, we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, this is an animation that I made out of a puddle of water um, of Mui Bridges running horse. 
Um, I made it uh, by cutting a stencil with my um, craft robot bow uh, vinyl cutter, which I might show you later. Um, and then I used a, a hydrophobic coating over the glass to corral water into these shapes um, to make each one of these individual frames. Um, when experimenting uh, and trying to figure out what projects to develop, I often think about Mary Oliver's just very simple instructions for living a life that we should pay attention and be astonished and then tell about it. Um, and try to uh, just remain pretty honest with myself and letting my astonishment lead me um, and hope that others are charmed by it as well. Um, this project really represents when I first got hooked on my own astonishment. So this is a wedding invitation that I did about a decade ago for my friend, um, uh, open source advocate, Karen Sandler and her husband, Mike. And it's based on this idea that like you can make a record player from almost nothing that you can like roll up a cone of paper, tape the needle to it. And that's enough to amplify that sound, those vibrations from those grooves into audibility. So this was a really fun A-B testing process because um, I bought like acupuncture needles, I bought sewing needles, um, I bought all kinds of different papers to try to like test out the parameters of like what is going to make <laughs> this little handheld record player the loudest. Um, and meanwhile, Mike and Karen were writing this really adorable song inviting guests to the wedding. Um, and we put it on a flexi disc, which is a totally clear and totally crappy uh, flexible acetate record. And you can see here that the, the couple on it, they're printed in black and all of the color you see it is the page beneath. So that way there's this interplay that when you rotate that clear disc, it like lines up with the underneath colors and it completes the couple in all of these disguises. So um, turn it 90 degrees and then you get like Karen and Mike here playing these together and another 90 degrees and they're eating and drinking and being merry. And then finally um, drawing old together and the reason that I did this was to a like entice people to actually turn the record, um, but also so that we'd have like a design fallback justification in case like the record didn't actually play because even though I had extensively prototyped and like AB tested every single needle and paper, there was always the possibility that you know, like the one number seven needle I had uh, happened to fit in the groove properly. And then the 300 I ordered from um, in bulk, like we're not gonna work. So always a peril, but um, it did work. And this is how it does. So um, the device corrals my mute sound wave vibration. Uh, Okay, so you could hear the actual recording versus the original song. And um, it was the funniest thing because like, I feel like all of my friends are the type of people who like sit around and like fuss over like record fidelity and like complain about like how like some obscure album like isn't in band camp or whatever. And, uh, but people really seem to like this thing that did not sound good, did not work well, only had one song. In fact, uh, it was so popular, it went viral. And um, I was stuck with this like really weird question, but it turned out to be a very generative question of like, well, like, isn't the whole purpose of like our high tech things, don't we want these technologies to, to function well? Um, and, you know, I thought about this, like, why is it that these like lo-fi glued and taped together things are so appealing and endearing, um, in a world where we can make like anything we want to happen on a screen happen. Um, and I eventually realized after just a lot of, a lot of reading, um, that there's this weird dimension in our relationship with our things that modern tech just like hasn't really provided or solved yet. 
um, modern tech gives us whatever we want. It's like winning at this game of wish fulfillment. Um, it's kind of its whole deal, but what it doesn't do in its black boxness is make the world legible to us in human terms in the way that we connect to the universe. Um, Brett Victor writes about how the scatterplot graph was actually a really important um, human invention because it was able to make information bioavailable to human perception. Um, this is just a little demonstration of that. If you look at the numbers on the left in a spreadsheet, uh, it's really hard for your brain to parse that. This is exactly how a computer wants those numbers. Um, but as humans, it's more difficult to read. But as soon as you take those numbers and put them on a map, it opens them up to our spatial reasoning um, and sort of like touchy-feely perception that we've, we've honed um, as a superpower over thousands of years just from navigating the world spatially. Um, so our more tangible reasoning skills like immediately flag like, all right, what's the outlier? You can find the high point, the low point. You can see the pattern, the spread. Uh, you can see where most of them are concentrated. You can immediately start reading this data that was completely obscured to your brain before. Um, and so I started thinking that like, you know, we really intellectually think and interact and intuit a lot about the world through our bodies and through touch, through friction and resistance, much more than anyone talks about. Um, it's kind of odd and, you know, oftentimes awkward to talk about like sensory experience. Um, you know, when I was studying art history, we would oftentimes call, you know, describing a painting and be like, oh, well, it's like dancing about architecture, um, which is why I think it's not done as, as much. Um, the nervous system, you know, doesn't end with the brain alone. It extends all the way to the skin. So everything we know as humans is an event on the skin, whether it's light hitting, hitting our retinas or sound, uh, vibrating our eardrums or molecules hitting our taste buds. We are simply um, hardwired as people to have these like very deep and rich intellectual and philosophical um, exchanges uh, with how we interface with the physical world. Um, you know, so since we're physical beings, um, you know, analog tech was always in the background secretly, uh, you know, in addition to doing the wish fulfillment thing, um, was fulfilling the secondary function of tethering us, us material beings to the larger universe of material things. Um, so like spending time fussing with an antenna to try to find a radio station provides a, a connection point between our bodies, our minds, and this technology um, that we're working with. So knowing that um, and wanting to like introduce, for example, uh, children who may have grown up with like digital devices, like into the magic of uh, the physical world, I started writing these books that teach through physical interaction and touch, um, making these like humble paper technology things that could function as a direct interface in the wonder of physics. So this first one is called This Book is a Camera. And um, it, it's a very literal title. Um, it lets the user reader uh, interact with light and learn about how light works uh, through using it as a pinhole camera. Uh, so you load photo paper into the dark, into the back of it in the dark, you take a photo and then you unload it in your bathroom and you can develop it in instant coffee and baking soda and water. Um, it takes pretty good photos. They're large format, so they're like four inches by, by five inches. Uh, and a year later, this follow-up came out. This was a larger co collection of devices that like asked my favorite generative question in the world of what can paper do? And answering with um, six different uh, paper technologies. Um, so people can take their hands and tinker with concepts of time and concepts of how calendars are organized, uh, concepts of encoding and, and encryption, um, play with a directionality of sound waves, play with pitch, um, play with how computers draw mathematically. Um, a spire graph is basically like an analog version of an, uh, open frameworks. Um, and 
also like how the stars in the skies work. Um, so this is another, another literal, super literal title. There's um, a little planetarium inside the book. Um, another argument that I want to flag that the straight jacket of this sort of like structured professionalized thinking in, in tech um, limits us is that um, we tend not to draw upon the full toolkit of human discovery because the line between craft and tech is oftentimes so rigid, um, which has more to do, I think, with the dominance of the Western Industrial Revolution than it does with craft techniques ability to produce function. Um, and so we might consider looking to non-Western cultures for their design wisdom um, when faced with like these high-tech challenges. For example, um, these technical uh, origami patterns are being used to solve problems in spacecraft design um, over at JPL and NASA. Um, this, what I'm showing you is a set of risograph origami tessellations um, that talk about paper as tech and explain that paper has a material memory that we can program uh, by folding. Once you fold the piece of paper, it never forgets where that line um, is and always wants to redirect pressure. So this is a series of different um, paper folding activities that provide like different choreographies um, of motion redirecting through these complex networks of folds. Um, this one is my favorite. This is the Miyori Ori fold, which um, converts an inert sheet of paper into a multi-directional paper spring. Um, and this form was developed by Koryo Miyori, um, who is an astrophysicist uh, who drew from the ancient tradition of origami. Um, and, uh, uh oh. <laughs> Hold on. Let me get back. Oh, there we go. Great. Uh, yeah. So he invented the Ori, Ori fold as a solution to, of all things, um, a satellite design problem. Um, it's 1955 um, flyer specifically. Um, if you Google uh, Manon Arya, um, I have his name typed onto this slide um, on YouTube, you can learn more about this thing. Um, it needed an array of solar shifting solar panels to track with the sun um, using minimal energy. And so uh, that's, that's how origami uh, came in to solve this problem. Um, beyond paper, a cat Ku Kia Imana writes that, uh, you know, she hates the term, uh, that basket weaving. It's, it's so often used as a shorthand for something irrelevant and useless, um, that there's so much math and plant care, planning, symbolism, story, and skill goes into basket weaving, um, that it's subtler arrogance to dismiss these knowledge systems. Um, there's just like a whole lot of knowledge systems that we don't think to tap into because they come out of these different craft traditions. Um, so in my work, there has been this trend of scaling down like these large scale concepts into like handheld tiny things. Um, but now that we are in 2021, I feel like all of the projects I'm working on this year are uh, ballooning sort of out of control. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit about like what's on my desk right now. So this year I'm working with Letterform Archives publishing program and I'm making a book that demonstrates typographic concepts um, with 17 different paper gadgets. So yeah, I made a one page pop-up book, a six page pop-up book and now we're like jumping to 17 pages. But um, all the prototypes are at the printer and I'm like writing the essays and doing the graphic design now. Um, this is a rough prototype of the cover that I'm showing you. And with this book, um, I'm exploring these mechanical idioms to explain the story of, of type technology. 
um, which progresses from the mechanical to this flat digital experience um, where all type is pretty much on screens now. Um, and the book largely focuses on this transitional moment from medical type to screen technology. So I'm employing this um, neon sort of RGB aesthetic uh, to the design. This is the, the letter A page. Um, this is a rejected prototype, but it sort of sums up like what I'm doing here. So here I was trying to create a physical analog for that expansive feeling of variable or parametric type on, on sliders um, that you pull this and all of these, um, <clears throat> all of these letters like turn into like their extended form uh, as you go ahead and pull that tab. Um, the essays focus on the notion that type is a impossibly microcosmic representation of culture that's ever changing. Um, and that the changes in the world and the changes that we see throughout history and technology um, are also perceptible if you look at type. It just happens in this teeny tiny subtle scale. So um, I'm hoping the book answers questions like, you know, when I see warped and distorted and projected type um, like you do like in like, the Fillmore posters, for example, why does it feel like psychedelia um, by tracing its aesthetic origin back to the source. Um, so this is the spread for the letter J and it's all about the aesthetics of light projection of projecting two dimensional shape onto um, three dimensional environments and how that warps and manipulates type. Um, so it's an experience you can have in your in your bathroom, um, but it has the attention of like conjuring up references to like the Joshua Light Show, um, Andy Warhol's plastic exploding inevitable, um, Brian Ginson's meditation device, um, <clears throat> and also ties into the basic mechanics of photo lettering, which rose during this time period um, as an alternative to metal type. This method allowed for a ton of experimentation, which is why we see all of this warping and distorted shapes and graphic design of this time. Um, it also allowed typefaces to be developed faster because they didn't have to be cast in lead. Um, another another one, um, you know, another 60s zeitgeist actually is why do certain typefaces like Uro style Stile, I never pronounce it right. Uro, Uro Stile, um, and this is a hand-drawn version of Palat. Why do these shapes always feel so mod? Um, so this is a prototype for the letter R page um, that's created out of 16 different spinning disks. Um, the animation of these disks works uh, simply through V-folds, which is kind of the simplest form uh, in paper engineering. Paper engineering is all about like taking one basic form and sort of like fractaling it out in like a, a crazy way. Um, so each one rotates on these hooks and then these circles. But the answer to why it feels so mod, um, like anagramma on the dashboards in 2001 of Space Odyssey is because all of these, these letter forms, these wide extended um, letter forms from the 60s are built upon a different shape than other letters have been. Um, they're built upon the shape of a super ellipse, um, which is a shape that like came on pretty strong in the 60s and then like went out of vogue really quickly, um, sort of forever to be associated with this like moment in time. Um, the super ellipse is a, a post-World War II invention, which is not quite organic, not quite geometric. Um, there's a certain level of technological uh, precision, industrial precision required to manufacture the shape. Um, it was identified and named by uh, the Danish poet and recreational mathematician Piet Hain um, for his uh, 1959 proposal for a redesign of a roundabout in Stockholm. Um, you know, he explained the shape's aesthetic presence as a compromise that like in the whole pattern of civilization, there have been these two tendencies, one towards straight lines and one towards circular lines. And each one has its drawbacks. And so he invented the shape called the super ellipse to, to solve this. Uh, and it made its way uh, as, you know, industry was able to produce 
this precision shape onto all of the industrial design of the time, onto TV, TV uh, screens, uh, the shape of plates. Uh, <laughs> he even made this like, this is called a super egg. It's a toy and the two options are it can sit upright or it can roll on its side. Um, so yeah, so this also made its way into typography of the time. Um, I am running out of time, so I'm gonna be fast. Uh, so it, I have to tell you the story. So like in 1968, uh, when um, the Vietnam uh, war negotiations were happening in Paris, they couldn't agree on the shape of a table. Should they have a you know, rectangular table? Should they have a circular table? Um, and ultimately they made the negotiation table in the shape of a super ellipse um, as a compromise between these two opposing geometric tendencies. So, um, so yeah, and that's why those shapes feel mod. So um, I'm just gonna gratuitously scroll past a couple of their prototypes. This is the mechanical O uh, that's gonna talk all about like mechanical signage in Las Vegas. Um, this one is all about Lim uh, Cruel. Uh, and I just put my URL in there in case you want to learn more about this book since I'm kind of speeding fast. Um, yeah, so these are all prototypes I just made um, on my desk with like spray paint and tape and glue uh, and paper. And I'm just gonna show you one, two more things really quickly. Um, another project that I'm scaling up, I've been researching this um, concept of moray magnification where you take a screen with apertures of one period and layer it over a printed grid of dots of the same period and it creates this magnification effect. So I've been playing with this at a small scale in books, but um, and scaling it up this year, I've then um, started to work on prototyping a clock based on this concept where time comes and goes. Um, so this is a clock with a whole bunch of little tiny twos and threes um, that uh, scales as you rotate it. Um, I've also been <laughs> making a more complex record player as part of a larger uh, sound in the same vein as uh, the other two books that I've made. Um, and then this, I just wanted to show you, I don't think we have time, but in case we have time to walk over and see the rest of my studio. Um, this is the most recent project that I just finished. Uh, this is a stop motion that I made for the new public festival. Yeah, so as you can see, I'm really obsessed with this idea of like craft materials being physically programmed. Um, so this N was like purpose built design to turn into this P when I pulled on a string, it cascaded into all of these little geometric shapes rolling up on each other. Um, so I love that. I feel like it uh, is sort of like a function that my eyes can follow. And I think it helps me uh, connect my human senses. And I, I think that that's sort of like the enduring um, legacy in Peel, uh, as well as the experimentation uh, that's offered by these different craft methods. So yeah, I think I went a little bit over goal and I'm so sorry, but that's what I have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly, for um, gifting us with uh, this view onto your work. Uh, we are a little bit over time and I think there's, a, there's been a great request um, coming from the, the, the Discord where all the, the chat's happening, which is um, rather than having you answer with, with words, I wonder if you could just take your camera over and just give us a, a, a glimpse that we can consume with our eyes. We could see your desk or your studio and we could, there's a lot of curiosity to sort of see the space you work in, which is something that we don't get in a normal kind of talk. Yeah, totally. So um, everything's a mess and it always is, but uh, this is my very long desk. I made it out of Ikea cabinets. And so there's like a lot of storage there. Um, I cut all of my paper stuff and all of the sheet plastic on this machine, which is, it's called a craft robo. 
it's a vinyl cutter. There's also one called a Cree cut. Um, there's also like, there's also a silhouette. Uh, and this is my set, which is like kind of destroyed right now, but that's how I made the, the new public thing. It's basically like all of these little geometric shapes and then there's strings that come down. And so I couldn't get it in one take. It was like, it was like 60 takes, but that's what computers are for. So um, yeah, I try to like do the things that computers do well on a computer and then do the things that computers don't do well, like, you know, shadow and texture and like little physical sounds and stuff like all of that physically. Um, this is like a random door I have with the entire contents of my ABC pop-up book taped to it. So like, that's how I know like what I'm gonna write about. <laughs> and um, yeah, and like what the pop-ups are. And then in here, this is kind of like my garage kind of, like I have, um, I have a letter press. I have storage for like printed things. I recently got, this is like my favorite thing in the world right now. This is a paper drill. So I can make like little notebooks and stuff. So, um, so yeah, that's pretty, pretty much it. I've been here like 12 years. And so like everything you've seen me make has happened here and I never leave my house even <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> Kelly, thank you so much for, for sharing with us.